Well, welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm Alden Gansky, uh, the author of book-length fiction and nonfiction, and um, most recently, the final book in the Harbinger series. This is episode number 20, the episodic mm -hmm. series of the Harbingers, last, last one in that series. And I'm Molly Jo Reilly. I am producer of the First in Fiction podcast, author of the Unemployment Cookbook and the upcoming mystery location novel, NOLA. And Aaron has gone I'm, offline. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I, you, you'll know, well, this is, where, this is the part where Heather introduces herself. Um, unfortunately, she's still um, trying to get to join the cast here. I was checking a message from her, so I didn't want to just have my phone out and look like I was disinterested in in the crowd and uh, mainly I didn't want to look like I was disinterested with Pops and, and Molly. Um, whether or not I am doesn't matter. I just didn't want to appear that way. So I was trying to be courteous and kind. So, yeah, uh, but yeah. it, she is, she is working to join us here. So once she joins, we'll uh, be privileged to hear her take on all that we have in store for us tonight. But we do want to remind those of you listening to the audio only podcast, you can watch us live at AaronGansky.com Tuesday nights, every other Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, you can also watch the YouTube at your convenience, which is super nice. Uh, so if you are chatting with us in the chat room, don't forget you've got some links up at the top. You can click on those and share the link with your social media followers so they can join in the fun and ask us all the burning questions that they have and make all the snide remarks that they have mm -hmm. uh, because we deserve them. Uh, it's late. It's Tuesday, so <laughs> uh, I'm sure we'll we'll say lots of silly things. But uh, we have an never. ask the author <laughs> never. We have an ask the author question from uh, Karth today through the firsts in fiction Facebook page, and he says this. He says, "Hey, I've heard you guys say a couple of times not to quote manipulate your reader, and I'd like to hear about this as someone who definitely writes with thematic and even political subtext in mind." How can one tastefully inject morality, criticisms of society, and that sort of thing into a story and do it tastefully like we've seen done in stuff by Orwell and others? I think that's a fantastic question. Mm -hmm. um, when, we, when I specifically talk about not manipulating your reader, it's the term I use quite often. What I generally mean is, is you don't want to toy with them. Uh, specifically, I mean, don't deliberately mislead your readers so that you can maybe have a twist ending or something like that. Um, if you're writing a mystery and you've got a red herring, that's one thing. But if you're giving them, you know, false information so that there's no way for them to discover the, the true murderer, you know, that's problematic. Um, if you set them up just so you can pull the rug out from underneath their feet at the end of the story, um, I think that's problematic as well. So, I, I, that to me doesn't necessarily go along with interjecting morality and criticisms of society. Um, I am fine with that. As a matter of fact, I, you know, I applaud it. Uh, I think it's a great technique to do um, when done properly and tastefully. Uh, you think about Orwell or one of my favorites, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. There are several different ways to go about it, but there are some commonalities as well. I think if you want to make commentary as an author, um, it's easier to do in third person omniscient um, or distant. It doesn't mean you can't do it in, in limited. It's just a little bit easier uh, when you're in third person uh, omniscient because you can follow multiple things. Uh, not a lot of editors are big into third person omniscient these days. A, a deal breaker, but a lot of editors aren't huge fans of it. Uh, especially if you're getting authorial intrusions where you are as the author making judgments on the character's actions that gets that's a big no-no these days uh, Kurt Vonnegut did it in the 60s and 70s it was a no-no back then but he's Kurt Vonnegut jr. and for whatever reason it endeared him to his readers I uh, became a you know best-selling author a Pulitzer Prize winning author all those types of things now uh, the other way that to do it, if you're not just in third person point of view, is to simply present it in story form. And I really think that's what you want to do. Orwell wanted to warn of a government with no, with too much unchecked power. So he writes 1984, which simply plays out that scenario. What is 
a government with unchecked power look like? Well, it looks like this, and he writes the book. He doesn't have to say, this is bad. When you read the book, you get the sense, this is bad. Mm -hmm. um, the stark contrast between what we know to be true, uh, what we know of life, and what we see in the novel is enough for the reader to say, you know what, that's, that's obviously a bad thing. Uh, even something as simple as The Hunger Games, if we're not talking about high literary novels here, and, and The Hunger Games wasn't bad, I'm not sliding it, but um, pretty much any dystopian like that is just gonna do the same thing. Here's the squalor in which we live, we're gonna contrast that against the wealthy or whatever government agency or whatever else it is, the opulence of what they have versus what the you know subjugated masses have. Um, that contrast is enough for a reader. We don't need to, you know, beat them over the head over it or say, you know, the government was doing evil things and they were evil. Like judgment call, the reader will determine and decipher based on your description what is evil and what is not. Uh, if you're worried that America is not reading enough, you write Fahrenheit 451. Uh, mm. it, it's all we, all we need to do as authors is present what we see as the societal problem. And I think our readers will make the conclusion that we want, well, they'll reach the conclusion that we want them to reach. It's all about how we paint that picture. What do you think, Pops? Yeah, I think that's good. But before I, I answer that, use a few terms. We want to make sure everybody understands what they are. Uh, why don't you tell us what uh, third-person omniscient is as opposed to third-person, say, limited? So third-person omniscient is where you can see into every character's mind um, and as opposed to third-person limited where you're telling the story through one character's uh, point of view, through their eyes um, and their experiences. Third-person omniscient, you can go from character to character to character, talking about what they see, what they think, what they feel, um, all of that stuff. And oftentimes in the old days, you would see authors using third person omniscient because they would speak as the author. Little did he know, dear reader, that blah, blah, blah. And what that's doing is it's the author, the author announcing their presence in, as the storyteller. Um, and that becomes distracting, especially to modern readers, uh, to contemporary readers. They, they don't, it's distracting and it breaks this, the experience. Most contemporary readers want an experience. They don't want to just be told a story. They want to experience that story. So that's really kind of fallen out of favor um, in terms of third person omniscient. Yeah, right. Uh, some call it the the God view, um, the God point of view, mm -hmm. uh, where the uh, narrator can see into every mind at every moment and uses that to describe um, some of the situations that's going on, uh, as opposed to limited, where you're limited to one character per scene. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same character in every scene, but uh, the only thing that character can know, talk about, deal with, react, is what is known to them or been revealed to them, even though they may be in a room with people who know more than they do, you don't know, skip heads. So yeah, well said, Aaron. Uh, I can't add Matt, much to what you said. Uh, you're spot on on this. Uh, it's, it's fine uh, for a character to have a point of view or an opinion about uh, a matter. It could be good. It could be uh, bad. It may not be what you like, but it may be uh, something you do like. So it's all right for them to have those kinds of opinions. Really, when you're talking about playing with the, the reader, toying with the reader, it's making them think one thing and then then switching it up on them. So you, you convince the reader that this is true, uh, but and then you turn around and change it. So, uh, for example, there's a big hubbub uh, in, back in the old evening soap opera Dallas, ah. uh, you know, who killed Jr. And then uh, you had to wait the whole off season to come back to the next season to find out it was only a dream. And oh. viewers got really upset with that um, because- that, was, that wasn't that was who killed Jr. That was when they killed off Bobby Ewing, wasn't it? I, I don't know. Bobby, uh, I do know. <laughs> what does that say about me? <laughs> They killed off Bobby and the fan re response was just horrific. And so they brought him back and the whole last season was just a dream. Yeah. And that's toying with the, the viewer in this case. It's toy in our case, we talk about toying with the reader where you, you set them up and lead them down a particular path and say, ah, not really. That path doesn't exist. Here's what really happened. Are from the old um, uh, Twilight Zone series. One of my favorite is uh, these families trying to escape the oppression of the government and they steal a spaceship and fly off. Uh, 
and for only for us as viewers to find out that they were going to another planet, a planet called Earth. Um, and so that's toying with the the viewer, toying with the reader, because through the whole show, they all speak English. They're all wearing the same kinds of clothes. They all look perfectly human. They all have the same family structure. It's all uh, what you would expect from your neighbors and people in your neighborhood. But then you switch it up and go, now nah, they're really from a different planet. And it's not uh, playing fair with the reader. So that's what toying with the reader is. But now to the point about having a political view or uh, the like, you don't want to have an ax to grind because you're writing fiction, but you can have a view. And the one who uh, I think went to the greatest extent to do this is uh, Michael Crichton's book, State of Fear. I don't know if you guys have read it, State of Fear from 2004. Um, and it really has to do with global warming. Well, Michael Crichton has his own point of view on this, but he keeps that to himself during the story. Uh, we see different points of view about global warming and the crisis, and there's stuff going on behind the scenes. There's a lot of drama and suspense going on behind the scenes. But he keeps his personal view out of it. We just see through other people's uh, points of view some of the, the different sides to the issue. But when you get to the end of the book, he has a small chapter uh, called uh, The Author's Message, and he tells you what his point of view is. He starts off, I've been reading about this for three years, and then he lists what he believes. And then he also has uh, two major appendices, uh, appendices and a very long bibliography, which you don't normally see in a novel at the end of books on the subject. So he let his views know, be known, but he just didn't do it in the story. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to, uh, to deal with those. What do you think, Molly? First of all, I think it was Bobby, and they shouldn't have killed him off to begin with. But, um, oh, you mean what you were saying. Yes, absolutely. I agree with everything that you were saying. Um, for me, it's also manipulating the reader is not just misleading them, but it also, for me, means telling them what to think, whether it's subtle, subtle or overtly, treating your reader with less respect than what they deserve. And as an author, your story should stand on its own. Of course, there's subtext and innuendo, but this still allows the reader to make up their own mind. And if, you write a, if you're writing a political thriller, for example, you, you can slant it toward a certain view, but that doesn't mean you expect all of your readers to be of that belief. And to kind of force your readers to go in that certain direction, I think takes a lot away from your story and the reader. I would say avoid it. As Aaron says, just write the story. It'll tell, it, it'll tell itself. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, write a nonfiction yeah. book. <clears throat> Say exactly. That what, That's what? always my point. I oh. said, or otherwise, just write a, a nonfiction yes. work on the subject. Yes. If you really want to get an opinion out there, um, then you, that's what nonfiction is for. And yeah. essays and letters to the editor. But again, it still can be done uh, to a degree, as Aaron's pointing out when he's talking about uh, Bradbury and Fahrenheit, uh, Fahrenheit 451 and the others, the Orwellian kinds of things. Uh, even in uh, the one that Rod Serling did called The Obsolete Man. It's an Orwellian situation where a man has been found obsolete because he's a librarian. You know, that great line, you have been found obsolete. It's a, it's a great episode. And so that's really, and much of that particular program uh, was socially based, social issues. And uh, he got his point across, but did it all through fiction. He didn't tell us what to think or manipulate us. He just showed it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Heather? And by the way, hello, Heather. Welcome. Hi, Heather. Welcome. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yay. Technical difficulties on my end. I'm so happy to join you. Yay. Happy you're here. So, yes. We're ready. Okay. I'm just yes. making sure. Um, no, my, I wouldn't have much to add to what you guys have already said other than just essentially, you know, the best thing to keep in mind in either case is that, you know, our readers are often a lot more sophisticated than we give them credit for. So no matter what we're doing on the page, we just have to make sure that we're honest and, and credible and we treat our readers respectfully because they're going to find us out one way or another. If we're trying to manipulate them, they're going to understand if we trick them. They're going to understand, and they're going to view our work accordingly. And they that leaves a bad taste in their mouth. I think um, nobody likes to be tricked or fooled or 
you, you hear Nelson's voice in the background from the Simpsons, just ha ha, you know, pointing and laughing. Nobody <laughs> likes that. So doing that to your readers is just kind of a special kind of uh, jerk move. So um, there is ways to do, to accomplish what you want to accomplish without having to resort to these types of, dare I say, I'm probably going to get some hate mail, but these kind of juvenile types of, or amateurish types of tricks where, um, it's you're trying to show off how clever you are rather than simply letting the story stand on its own. So um, thank you guys for your for your thoughts on that. Let's go ahead and roll up our sleeves here, figuratively speaking, though literally I may do the same thing because it's a little bit warm uh, where I am. Got thunderstorms, by the way, lots of uh, thunder and lightning. So if I disappear, I've left Pops in charge. Uh, I apologize for that, uh, viewers, but uh, I, can't take it back now. So is the wind blowing from your house toward mine or away? Because I want some thunder. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I, I, I'm not a meteorologist, so okay. Well, <laughs> uh, we'll we'll figure that out. So today we're we're talking about 20 rules for writing novels because who doesn't love rules in fiction? And we've done several episodes on. Uh, fiction writing rules, what we think of them, are they good, are they bad, etc. Um, and so now we're going to take a look at a list devised by award-winning, best-selling author Alton Gansky. Uh, and, and you, Pops, have compiled a list here of 20 rules, uh, we put that in quotation marks, of course, for writing novels. Uh, the first one here, what, what do you say is the first novel? Well, the first one is dress your story in facts. Um, most people think, well, it's fiction. I don't need facts, but you really do for the story to bring true with your readers. And so what I mean by that is write what you know. We've all heard that, but you need to add to that the uh, idea that you need to learn what you don't know. And that's half the fun of writing is uh, it's good to write from what you know, but there's plenty to learn. You just have to go out and learn it. So uh, dress your story in facts, write what you know, and learn what you don't know. Which is super important because adding that those facts are going to lend credibility to your speaker, your speaker to your to you as a speaker. Mm -hmm. It's going to lend credibility to your story. Your story is going to become richer, um, and it's going to feel true and authentic. And that's what we really want. Um, that kind of dressing your story up in those facts is really going to have that payoff that you want later on in the end. Mm -hmm. Molly, you've got a couple things. I do. I didn't know how much time we had. <laughs> um, I love the learn what you don't know part because for me, it's part of the adventure of writing. And for the last several years, from the high desert of California, I've immersed myself in the New Orleans culture. Research comes by way of the internet, Google Maps, Google World, uh, food, recipes, online research, actually making some of these recipes and meals, connecting with others who have been to New Orleans and have local insights. For me, that's just all part and parcel of the whole writing experience, and I love it. But also, as an editor, it's important to learn what you don't know, because even novels will read as true stories. We get involved. We care about the characters. We believe it to be true. So even if you've created a 10th planet world that we know nothing about, that has nothing to do with Earth and humankind, you're going to make it believable. You're going to add some sort of truth that the reader can relate to. But if you are doing any kind of realistic earthbound or something novel, make sure that if you're adding historical facts or real facts, that they're actual facts. Don't present it as something. If you're not sure, double check your stats. Um, as an editor, there's nothing worse than editing for somebody who, you know, draws a, a chain of mountains that go 300 miles into the ocean where they shouldn't be. So if everything else is true, please verify your information. Yeah, I, I like the way that you spin this pop so and write what you know and learn what you don't know. Um, I I think, I don't know, you may have also spun it as um, right. I don't know if you, if you said that or if I'm just imagining that, but I kind of like that, that little twist on that. Uh, did you, you, I think you dropped out there. I missed part of what you said. I, I was saying, like, I think, Pops, that you've said, know what you write, as opposed, we've heard the expression, mm -hmm. uh, write what you know. I'd like to see yes. that flip and know what you write, and I've heard you say that, and I think that's a good way of looking at it. Right. Um, Heather, what do you think of uh, dressing your story in facts? 
I think everything you guys have said is terrific. Usually when I'm teaching or if I'm working with a client, I always like to also say, just write what you want to find out. You know, some of, some of the best stories, um, in, including my novel, when I sat down to write my first novel, really things that I wanted answered. And so I was able to go and they can even be profound questions you know for for my first book it had to do with just exploring grief so it's about not just writing what you might know factually or from a place of truth inside of you but but also not being afraid to go out and not just research facts but answer the bigger questions inside yourself what is it that you want to know about the world and writing a book to figure that out yeah absolutely uh Number two, Pops, your characters must be believable. That's number two. Your characters must be believable. And this is something that we talk about in the business quite a bit, uh, believable characters. And the question always comes up, how do you write a believable character? For me, this just simply means your characters need to have some sort of flaw. They're perfect, uh, no matter how close I am, <laughs> which is not close at all, by the way. Um, nobody's perfect. And we've all got some sort of hurdles to overcome. That's what makes is when they've got some sort of uh, you know baggage. They've got something that they need to to overcome in order to um, to rise up. And we like to see that. We like to see those types of stories. This makes their journey more important. Um, it's why we have character arcs. That's why those exist. And that's why it feels so when we see. Uh, a character coming from point A to point B and how they've become more experienced and they've learned something along the way. Uh, but they, they can't do that if they already know everything. So beginning with a character that's flawed in some regard, doesn't have to be awful, but um, some sort of character flaw uh, is going to give them a, a journey that they can undertake that's going to uh, result in growth. And that is going to ultimately end up with a character that is believable. Mo is Molly there? Molly's in the chat room, huh? Okay. Well, how about I'll, I'll go ahead and do hers then. Uh, she said, uh, "Don't make them so flawed that the reader doesn't care about them. Even wimps and bullies have some redeeming qualities." And that's a good observation. Uh, it is possible to have a protagonist who is almost an antihero who you don't especially like, but there's something either about the person or what the person's trying to do. There's enough noble quality that you want them to succeed. Uh, so you can do that. But those characters, again, must be believable. If uh, you go too far beyond the pale, then uh, it breaks the illusion for the reader. Now, it, that will depend on, um, on your genre. For example, uh, Superman is not believable. But the environment that he's written in uh, and all the backstory that goes with it the reader's willing to assume, okay, I, I will believe for the sake of the story that uh, he can do these things. Uh, but that takes, uh, you know, it takes a deft hand. And usually it, it will depend on uh, the, the genre that you're writing in. So it does take some care, uh, but they must be believable. And, and sometimes our tendency is to make, a, well, I call them Easter Bunny characters, those little chocolate Easter bunnies you used to get and you bite their ears off and they're hollow inside. And so we mm -hmm. tend to write the characters that look good on the outside, you know, like chocolate, uh, but really they're hollow. Uh, so they need to perhaps have some fall, uh, faults, some maybe some weaknesses. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be crippling, but it is something they have to struggle with as they do what they do, or just limits as uh, limitations as a human being. So that's what I uh, would add uh, to Molly's uh, addition there. How about number three? You ready for that? Sure. Your characters must act in a believable fashion. Mm. Your characters must act in a believable fashion. Nothing ruins a story faster than having a character do something that is just utterly, utterly stupid. I'll give you an example of I, a little bit, but you go ahead. Yeah, they've got to act in a manner that's consistent to their character as well. And that's as you've constructed it. And so if you've got, uh, you know, a character that's afraid of everything, they, they're probably going to continue to be afraid. They're not going to just all of a sudden 
become the bravest person on the block. Um, they might have an opportunity where they can exercise bravery, um, but it's not necessarily going to be something that just immediately happens. Uh, keep it simple is the, the main point here. Um, ask yourself what your character would actually do in this particular situation. Occam's razor definitely applies here, which suggests that um, people often overthink answers to very simple problems. Um, I was uh, recently read a, a story um, in which somebody was wounded and everybody kind of looked around like, hmm, I wonder how they got hurt. And I'm thinking, well, if somebody's hurt, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to provide some sort of medical care. You're going to see how bad the wound is. Um, you're going to also determine whether or not the threat is still around because this was obviously a, a threatening thing. It was like a bow and arrow or a, a gun or something like that. So you're going to try and figure out where that came from instead of just, you know, mildly questioning, hmm, that is a strange sight indeed. Uh, what's, the, what's the first thing that's going to happen? And then have them do that. I think it mostly comes down to just having characters that are authentic to how we have written them, how we've presented them. If they're acting within the realms of the characteristics that we've put on the page, because as long as we're consistent, um, even the actions of an unreliable nar narrator who does strange or authentic and consistent, our readers will go along with us. Like Alton pointed out, I mean, you could have a character like Superman because the world that we've created around him allows a superhero. So just make sure that we're authentic and consistent and that will make our characters, you know, act in a believable fashion. You know, you mentioned uh, unreliable narrators and I, th I think of the, you know, the ultimate example of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart when he, you know, we believe that he's going to murder a guy because he's got a vulture eye. Like we believe that, like that's just because dude's crazy. And we know that. And we also believe that he's going to dig up this body in front of the cops because he hears a mysterious heartbeat. And we understand that it's the guilt and the, the, the guilty conscience working on him. Um, he's acting in a believable fashion, even though no one in their right mind would ever behave that way. The whole point is that he's not in his right mind. Um, and so he's consistent with that. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's it. Yeah. Very, very good point. Uh, number four, Pops? Number four, the protagonist must face a conflict that requires a resolution. And I think the conflict that we're looking for here is something that's relevant to someone other than just your character. Okay. Uh, I, the old story is that you could write a, um, write a story about a man who's thirsty. You know, every character has to want something, even as, if it's as simple as a glass of water. Um, that's a real conflict for him. He's really thirsty and he wants a glass of water and he doesn't have one, but that's not really compelling to anybody else. Um, so the conflict has to be relevant to people other than just your character. Um, I think it's, if they're serving a purpose that's larger than them, that means there's more at stake. The stakes are higher. Um, what happens when your character can't fix the conflict? Uh, this is what we call in the writing business, asking the question, what's on the line? Um, what what horrible thing may transpire if your character doesn't succeed in resolving this conflict? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be saving the world. It could be saving a marriage. Um, you know, it could be something a, a little more um, important or, or personal, I guess, on, on that personal level there. It might just be an old woman trying to thread a needle, um, but it's important to her because this represents her individuality and her ability to take care for her, of herself, uh, those types of things. So it should matter to your character and it should matter to people beyond your character as well, because if this poor old woman can't thread a needle, then someone else is gonna have to take care of her. And that's going to uh, you know, put them in a, a different position. They might have to make some sacrifices that they, they don't wanna make. So that's the thing about the conflict. It should matter to your character and it should matter to other people. Um, that's, that's my take on it. Uh, I don't yeah. know if Pops or Heather, yeah, when you I got think more about, there. Yeah, when I think about the, the old man in the sea, for example, the old man has to catch a fish. That's mm -hmm. okay. For him to be able to keep his protege, for him to keep the respect of the town, he has to catch a fish, even though he hasn't caught one in a long time. And that's the conflict that requires a resolution. For some reason, he can't catch him. 
He needs to do that. And so that's the conflict within him. He either has to give up or he has to go out and do something that he normally would not do. Uh, and, and he does exactly that. So, yeah, there's there's got to be some kind of conflict that requires a resolution. Now, again, that's going to vary from genre to genre. The conflict in a romance is going to be different than a conflict perhaps in a Western, than in a sci-fi, uh, than in a fantasy novel, action, adventure. Uh, it could be any uh, number of things, uh, but it's going to vary from uh, genre to genre. But still, there's going to be some kind of conflict. And there's an old line that says, if you don't have conflict, you don't have a story. I believe that. I agree with that, too. Yeah. Uh, number five, unless Heather has something she wants to add. I always have something I can add, but I also realize that we've got 20 of these to get through. <laughs> we do have 20 of these. How about this? Um, Pops, why don't you read number five for us, and Heather, I'll let you handle number five. All right. Oh. You said you want me to handle number five? Sure. All right. So here's number five. Characters must change, grow, step up, step down, get out of the story. Yeah, so long story short, make sure that your character is an active part of a story. If they're not, they're just distracting from the main conflict and the main characters. I always like to tell people that uh, I'm working with, either teaching or editing, that if there is any character on the page that could disappear from the story or from the novel and it doesn't make some sort of dramatic impact on the story, first place. There should be no characters, you know, on the page that if they were if they weren't there, that wouldn't make any difference. You know, I, I had that come up in uh, an early version of the Hand of Adonai series. I had a character that that came in and he was going to be a major player in this whole story. And then he vanished and uh, <laughs> never got back to him. And then I went back and I was like, well, why is he still here then? You know, so I had to, uh, he had to get out of the way is what it was. I thought he was going to step up or grow or, or step down, but um, he did nothing at all except uh, it was a remnant from a, another storyline that I had in my mind that never came to fruition. So um, you, you want to consider that as well. And well, that's part of being that... a... I'm go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Okay. <laughs> that's part of being an intuitive writer is uh, some of it's going to be, a little haphazard. If you're an intuitive writer, and by intuitive writer, I mean you don't outline, you get in your character's shadow and you follow behind them. And some people are just wired to write that way and there's nothing wrong with it, but you have to keep track a little better than someone who outlines. Uh, and what often happens for intuitive writers, discovery writers, if you want to call them that, um, is characters will pop up and then you get, you know, 25, 30 pages down, maybe more, and you realize that character is unnecessary. Well, that's all right. Uh, you, you cut them out. That's what the second draft is for. Um, so don't worry about it at the time you're writing your first draft. You worry about it when you're editing, when you're cutting things down. So, but I do want to add one word of caution here. We often hear this, and uh, I just did an interview with um, Stephen James on his program, and he was asking me uh, about this. You often hear this idea that your character must change. There's a character arc. Uh, and that is often the case, but a lot of that comes from literary writing where there needs to be an internal change. There are genres in fiction that really don't require that. James Bond, for the most part, does not change from book to book. Uh, now, there will be a few things, uh, you know, the, he loses a wife. Same thing happens with Clive Cussler's character, Dirk Pitt. Uh, he's pretty much the same through most of the books. He does grow older in the, it's a very long series of books, uh, but early on he changed very little until he lost a loved one and then he was, that was a pretty big change. But for the most part, you don't always have to have that kind of internal conflict and change within a protagonist. Sometimes you do. So if you're doing more literary work, uh, more coming of age kind of stuff, say, uh, then you might have to deal uh, with that. But otherwise, you, you as long as your character is changing in relationship to the circumstances, are they doing what they must do? Do they have to overcome their fear? That sort of thing that uh, is often plenty of uh, enough change. Um, and in my case, I did a book called Wounds, where a seminary professors pressed into service helping the police solve a uh, series of murders by a serial killer. They realize there's a biblical bent to it and they don't 
know what to do with that. So they recruit him, not knowing that he has a connection to this. Well, he has to change. He has to get out of his ivory tower. He has to uh, interact with people, which he doesn't like to do. And so he has to go through a lot of personal changes. Mm -hmm. So even though that was a thriller, um, in that case, that character needed to change emotionally and intellectually as well. Hmm. So let's move on to, to number six then, Pops. All right. The strength of the protagonist is measured by the threat of the antagonist. I'd like you to think I'm the one that came up with that, but I didn't. Terry mm -hmm. Brooks wrote that in Sometimes the Magic Works, and it was uh, formative in my own writing. I never really thought about that. The strength of the protagonist is measured by the threat of the antagonist. So uh, the, w one of the illustrations is, it is okay for Popeye to beat up Brutus, but he can't beat up Wimpy. His, <laughs> his only crime is asking for a hamburger. All right. If he beats up Brutus, he's a hero. He, Brutus is the bad guy. He's the antagonist. If he beats up Wimpy, who's just a, a color hungry. character and hungry, <laughs> who's just hungry with that, then Popeye's, you know, he's evil. He's a beast with that. Hmm. But nonetheless, for your protagonist to be heroic, the antagonist has to be bigger and badder in some way or another. Don't confuse me with on this. Uh, one of my most frightening uh, antagonists in one of my books is confined to a wheelchair uh, and is dying of a neurological disease. Oh, but wow. he has a lot of hate and a lot of money. And so he can get done pretty much whatever he wants to get done. So he has power of influence and, and money. So, and, and no one cares about Rocky versus the seven-year-old, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not <laughs> there. Um, year old has a gun case it's a it's more interesting right and so like you say pops they don't have to be physically imposing like a bluto is it is, is it bluto you said brutus is it bluto it, it, was, had, both. it was both it had two names they switched oh, someplace along the line one, mm -hmm. one was his middle name i guess uh, a lot of people really don't realize this. a lot of people don't realize this but um, popeye didn't always eat spinach initially it started off as asparagus no, really? I'm lying. No, I'm lying. I'm lying. I was wow. going for the cheap joke. <laughs> it just fell too bad. So I thought it was Brussels sprouts. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Anyhow, moving on. So yeah, uh, giving giving your. I mean, if your antagonist is going to be bad, they've got to have, you know, some. There's got to be some sort of stakes involved, um, and so you can increase the the conflict by increasing the. Uh, the threat of the antagonist, and that's going to make your protagonist more um, compelling. Uh, I can give you this information about twenty chapters ago. You're welcome. Thanks. Timely, I, timely advice here at First in Fiction. I think it's um, the writer James Scott Bell that, um, in his writing craft book. Uh, Conflict and Suspense has a great line in there where he kind of basically says that your antagonist should in many ways be perceived as being better than your protagonist. Just essentially because you want your reader to believe that there's no way that your protagonist can succeed in defeating the antagonist, it, whoever that antagonist could be. Is it another man? Is it nature? And like Alton said, it doesn't have to be in a physical way. You just want your reader to believe that um, that your main character could fail because it's that worry that's going to be the story engine that's going to get the reader to turn the page. Absolutely. Uh, number seven pops. Demonstrate, don't lecture, which is a, just a different way of saying show, don't tell. And this kind of goes, I think, into what we were talking about during our Ask the Author segment where he was asking about how do you make... Um, how do you make political statements and, and things of that nature? Um, when when you say demonstrate, don't lecture, which you say is show, don't tell, I also take that as as um, don't lecture. People don't want to be lectured at. They don't want to be talked to. They, um, I read so many stories written by students that are about the evils of drunk driving, and they want to show how evil it is to, to drive drunk or whatever the case may be. But I think if you're starting out with the, with the idea of I'm going to prove this political concept or philosophical concept, I think that's going to be free. Um, I think instead you want to begin with the story 
And then as you write that story, let the moral kind of announce itself, let the themes announce themselves independent of your prompting. So this is like you said, Pops, not your ax to grind. Uh, Stephen King talks about this in his book on writing, where he says he doesn't think about symbols or themes or anything like that. Um, not to say that his novels don't have them, they do, but they are all things that announce themselves through the process of him writing the story. So he simply asks, what if, what does it look like? Uh, and he moves on and and lets the story kind of form itself. And then he'll go through and he'll highlight certain aspects that he feels need uh, to be. The ways you do that is you just prune out what doesn't belong anymore. Is that kind of what you were going for, Pops? Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly that. Uh, the, the show don't tell just simply simply means you, you reveal in action rather than just state something. So if someone's angry, you don't say he's angry. You, you know, you show the pulsing artery in his neck, the clenching of the fist, the grinding of the teeth, whatever. Uh, doesn't have to be, you know, even that extreme, but you do more showing than telling. Um, otherwise it gets very difficult to, to follow and it loses interest. It just loses energy. Hmm. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Heather, anything to, to add to number seven? No. Oh, you're still on mute. <laughs> yeah. As I was talking, I realized that. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, number eight pops. Reveal information slowly. So don't, so, yeah. don't rush to action. Don't contrive situations. Avoid laundry, laundry list descriptions. Take your time uh, in revealing information. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say, reveal information slowly. slowly. <laughs> See, when, I, when I go back and edit the audio part, it's going to cut out all that silence and nobody's going to get the joke. Okay. Well, <laughs> Anyway, I mean, these guys are dumb. Why are they laughing? All right. Uh, pacing is key. So go too slow. You, you want to reveal information slowly, yes, but you don't want to reveal it too slowly because at that point, um, readers are going to get bored. Uh, you do it too fast, the reader's overwhelmed. They don't know what's important, what isn't. Um, this kind of falls into the category of too much telling. Um, I really think that the places where people tend to speed up the most are the places where they need to slow down the most. There's a lot of action happening, so they want things to happen quickly. And so they write very quick sentences, mm. move through a scene. And I think um, where you want to really slow down, great um, car crash by Dennis Johnson and it's uh, content warning, uh, a lot of drug use, et cetera. Um, but what sticks out to me, I read it while I was at, at college, and what sticks out to me most about that particular story is he describes a car crash, which is something that happens rapidly, but he takes pages, slows everything down, and he describes it in this bizarrely beautiful language. And so you're looking at a car crash, which should be horrifying, but you're struck by the beauty of it. Um, and it's really kind of, I don't want to say unsettling, but it's its striking. Um, and I think there are times where stuff like that, we want to slow down and really develop it and, and develop those sensory types of experiences. Um, and so that's one thing that you'll want to do. Avoid the, the, avoid the urge to move too quickly from point A to point B. I see a lot of outline writers doing that. I'm not trying to call them out. Pops, you were mentioning some of the problems with discovery writing. I've, I've faced them all. I'm a discovery writer, but I also know that in outlining, um, people tend to move from point A to point B far too quickly um, just because they want to get there and they forget that there's a lot of stuff that happens between A and B and they often don't give that its due. Uh, what do you think, Heather? I was going to throw in that I'm in complete agreement that, you know, I think sometimes the instinct of writers is to rush through those action, she action scenes and then spend too much time um, in more of the contextual scenes. But even more so than that, I've noticed there are a lot of writers who have instincts to rush through 
what are some of the uncomfortable things for them to write? Some of those hard emotional truths that we may face or these uh, really dramatic scenes that they're difficult to write as a writer and to feel like we're getting done doing correctly. And so our instinct is to sort of rush through them and not do the work that is necessary for the most time. So think about whatever your instincts are and often do the opposite. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, there, there's a fine line, there's a balance. You don't want to dwell too much on, on some of those uncomfortable things, but you want to also not shy away from it. Um, yeah, don't, don't run away from doing that hard work because, I mean, that's what a lot of, of writing is. It is hard work, so don't shy away from it. I, I completely agree with that. Um, story, too, about um, at Antioch, the mantra was write what you're afraid of, um, and I didn't for a long time. Uh, because you know what what terrifies me is anything happening you know bad things happening to children and so when when I kind of attacked that head on and wrote some of those stories which by the way nobody's ever read and nobody ever will read um, it was uh, it was difficult I no, believe you, you sent me some of those uncomfortable stories Aaron <laughs> uh, I, I don't think Maybe the world did at large <laughs> no I don't think you saw the bad one but we'll talk later we'll talk later anyway um, <laughs> It, it was very, very difficult to do, um, but also necessary, I think, for my growth as a writer. And it's not something that I'm going to publish because it's not, you know, I, I did it more as a, a writing exercise or a prompt. But like you say, sometimes the things that you want to rush through are sometimes the things that you need to take a little more time on. Don't go overboard. You don't want to beat the reader over the head with it, but spend a little more time there. Uh, Molly, you, you added something to the show notes just now. Uh, I, I did. I No, that was the one for the next one underneath. Am I ahead? It, it, oh, no. my goodness. I can't yes, follow show no. notes. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, Pops, why don't you lead us to number nine, where Molly has added a nice little note at the end. Don't talk to the reader. Tell the story. That's so right. This is uh, Pops here is the authorial intrusions, the little did he know, dear reader. Is that what kind of where you're going with this? Yeah, exactly. Um, and it used to be a uh, commonplace uh, the illustration I always like to use is somebody walking uh, along a, a dirt path out in the, towards the wilderness and it's raining and the wind is blowing and there's lightning and he needs to find shelter and he sees an old haunted looking house and he heads for it. Uh, and he knocks on the door and then the author writes, little did he know, dear reader, what horrors lay behind, behind that uh, mighty oak door. Okay. That's authorial intrusion. It's also prophesying, which is in the next one. So I'm just going to combine these two. Um, but it's also prophesying, saying some danger is back there. And now I'm going to tell you, dear reader, what that is. Uh, it, don't address the reader unless you're doing avant-garde stuff. But in regular popular fiction, yeah, don't address the reader. Just tell the story with well, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm-hmm. And you know, my my addition to that was treat your reader like a fly on the wall. Resist the urge to explain everything. Treat your reader like a character who's already there and has a certain set of, uh, or a certain knowledge of the scene that's already at hand, unless you are creating a whole new science fiction fantasy world in which you have to detail everything at the beginning, but don't, oh, they walked into the room. There was Bob. Bob was standing holding a glass. Just say, you know what, Bob took a drink. Okay, we know that he's holding the glass already. So don't don't describe absolutely every detail. Trust your reader to to interpret what's already going on. Let them contribute the right to details. the story. Yeah, let them contribute to the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give them the right details. Don't give them all the details. Uh, yeah. the, here's the reason why, um, if, if I may, from my kind of perspective, um, why are authorial intrusions bad? I, The reader is reminded that they're a reader. It breaks the enchantment. It breaks the suspension of disbelief, right? Mm -hmm. um, you see a movie, you want to believe what's happening is real. And the minute they go, they jump the shark, oh, that would never happen. Now you're dissatisfied with the, the film and the product because you've been taken out of it. You, you are now reminded that, you know, oh, I, I can see the strings on which they're flying. This is obviously fake and it ruins that suspension of disbelief. Um, authorial intrusions do that. They, 
they announce that you are telling a story. They remind the reader that they are a reader and that you are the author. Um, and I think the real crime in it, though, is that it, it's distracting from the story. The, the ultimate test of a story is can it stand on its own? Its, its merits are its own, or at least it should be. And the minute you try and, and point things out, um, you're no longer allowing the story to tell itself. And I think that's the real crime. Now, obviously, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. did it. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, I think he did it well because his wasn't the prophesying, like you say, Pops, like, here comes danger. Warning, Will Robinson. It was it was more of um, little winks and nods to the, to the readers that they were funny um, and they were endearing um, and they were part of his voice. And I don't know that it's something that can be reproduced. It was just something that was unique to him. Um, same way Cormac McCarthy doesn't use quotation marks. Why not? Because he's Cormac McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Like he can do that. If I write a story without quotation marks, people will pull me aside and, and have serious talks with me. But um, some people are able to do that for the rest of us peons. Um, we got to follow the traditional structure rules. Um, Heather, you have thoughts on these? No, I, I'm in complete agreement. The only thing I, I will say is I'll make a brief distinction between this sort of authorial intrusion and what is sometimes referred to as breaking the fourth wall, which is when your character, um, not, not the author, um, direct a comment toward the reader. Now, again, this is not something commonly used or probably accepted in popular fiction, but it is something that um, is occasionally done in both movies and books, but is something different than authorial intrusion. So if our listeners are so inclined to read further, um, that's breaking the fourth wall. Very good point. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, good distinction there. And that term actually comes from the stage. It comes from acting where um, right. the actors and actresses would look out to the audience, which is commonly called in, in acting the fourth wall is the one that's not there. Um, and you break that fourth wall by directly addressing the audience. Shakespeare had his characters doing that. That's why we have the term aside. That's what, I mean, happened. So, um, and just last year, the famously, movie Deadpool did it. And the, yeah. the movie did it because the comics have done it. The Deadpool yes, comics because have done it's, it Yeah, years. because it's a lot more common in comics. And, you know, also just FYI, Deadpool, uh, an, an adult only movie. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to go ahead and put a content warning doesn't. on that one. No. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't take the kids to that one. Oh, not, okay. not a kid movie. So, hmm. well, um, we are rapidly running out of time and we are only halfway. So my suggestion pops, if you're okay with it, maybe we split this into part one, part two. That's uh, that's fine with me. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and do that. So before we sign off for the night though, Molly, uh, questions, comments, concerns from the chat room. There was a, uh, it was a smaller chat this evening, but it was nice. It was Jacqueline was in for a little bit. Tess and Andy were in the group. Becky wanted to show up. She texted me earlier, said she is working on an interview for the article for the newspaper, so she was not able to make it. Um, Tess backed me up and said, yes, it was Bobby Ewing that they killed off in Dallas, and he was resurrected a year later naked in the shower. Thank you for that little tidbit of information there, Tess. <laughs> she says, Tolkien got his opinion on the harm of industrialization carefully woven through The Lord of the Rings. And acting out of character is what killed the movie Howard the Duck for her. She said, and I'm trying to read this. She admits all the movie is poor, but in the end, Howard decided to be the hero when the character would have saved the day by accident when trying to run away and save his own feathery behind. So I've never seen the movie. I'm not really sure, but it makes sense to me. She writes romance, so it has to end happily. She doesn't like Nicholas Sparks, whose romance ends bittersweet. And something about Santiago went 84 days without catching a fish. That must have been when I was offline temporarily because I have no idea what conversation that's a part that's a, of. <laughs> that's from the old man in the sea. There you go. And she said, Tess again says, step up or get out of the way is also true for plot points. Nothing is more frustrating to her when a plot thread is introduced and then goes nowhere. And she confirms that Bluto it was Bluto in the comic strip, Thimble Theater, but it was changed to Brutus for the cartoons for Popeye. 
And Jacqueline, before she dropped out, said, thanks, Erin. Her one sheets are finished and ready for Blue Ridge. Nice. Nice. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. So, well, good stuff. Good stuff. So uh, in two weeks, then what we will do is we will finish up the 20 rules for writing fiction. Um, the last 10, we'll go over those and uh, then we will continue on. We'll have a new ask the author question for next week as well. So we thank you all for joining us this week and we look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, good writing. <laughs>